you that I learned quite a bit about JavaScript volunteering for Scale AV. Yeah? <laughs> and apparently if you want to join us at Repair Cafe and help repair stuff, it's great fun and apparently we were breaking the law <laughs> until like a few months ago because we repair stuff all the time including phones and transistors and game consoles and all sorts of other stuff. So it's great fun, but we may be in violation of the law. <laughs> but you can learn how electronics work, help fix stuff, and just enjoy the community. So, uh, anything else about me? Uh, yes, so my primary language is currently is C++. That's what I, I, I work in on a daily basis. I spend a lot of time as a professional Java engineer, and I do quite a bit of Python at my job. JavaScript was kind of a hobby that I picked up as part of Scale AV and did some websites. And this talk, as many of you may have noticed from the title, started out as a deep, hatred rant about how terrible JavaScript is because it's potentially the worst programming language ever invented. But this talk is meant to be fun, hence the rather odd caricature of my face here on the screen. <laughs> this is supposed to be a fun talk where we, you know, kind of lightheartedly rib each other about our programming languages and most importantly learn some cool best practices about JavaScript. So who's ready to begin? Before we get further, I'd like to get a feel who uses JavaScript on a daily basis. Okay. Programming or uh, programming wise. Uh, how many of you have never used JavaScript? How many of you absolutely love JavaScript? It's okay, you can be honest. Yeah, you can be honest. And how many of you hate it with just this fiery passion? Alright. More people in my camp. I got bad news for you. Wow. After researching some of this talk, my opinions are starting to shift. It's terrifying. Now, how many of you know basic programming? And how many of you are new to programming? Like basic? No, no, not basic the language. <laughs> like standard programming practices, yes? Great. And how many of you have no coding experience whatsoever? Great. I just wanted to get a feel for the audience because as Carlos was mentioning earlier, we're kind of getting into this new discussions about software engineering and best practices. And so as we move forward with this talk, I like to try to fit it to my audience. I don't know how well I'll do that. So the next thing is needed concepts. So on the left, we have some basic concepts that I would like you to understand for the talk. And on the right, we have some context uh, concepts that we will cover during the talk. So. If there's a concept on the left-hand side, this side over here, I don't know if this is actually your left, um, please shout it out now if you do not understand it so that we can cover it real quick. Does everybody understand basic coding like variables, functions, and loops? What's a first-class function? First-class function, great question. So, in a lot of languages, functions are functions and data is data. So in C, a function is a function and data is data. In languages that treat functions as first class members or a first class function, you can take that function and pass it around. You can assign a variable to hold that function and you can pass that function to other function calls. So in, a, in essence, we are treating functions as data or we're treating code itself as data. That's what I mean by first class function. What language is Yes, the function is essentially an object. So in Java, this is called a functor. In C, it's a nice little class that wraps a function pointer. And in Python and JavaScript, it's just native part of the language. All functions are objects themselves. Does everybody understand that? Sometimes called the code reference. Sure. All right, how about scoping? Does everybody understand scoping? Not specific to JavaScript. Well, we'll get into the specifics for JavaScript, but general the idea that variables exist in scopes, and sometimes you can't see them because they're in the wrong scope. Spoiler, they're horrible in JavaScript. Yes. We will get to that. You said callbacks. So callbacks is when you take one of these first class functions and pass it to somebody and say, go do work, and when you're done, call this function. In essence, they call you back. So imagine going into the store and saying, I need new tires on my car, and then leaving, and they call you up on the phone and say, we're done. It's the same thing in code. You pass them a function, and when whatever they're doing is finished, they run this function for you. We'll get to that. Do you promise? OK. And then on this side, we will talk about the, these things here. So 
Any questions on this slide before we get begin? These are the concepts that we're going to try to build this talk on. So if something is a little confusing, shout now. Or just heckle me. Go ahead. Closures. Closures. So the two on this side are things that we might understand, but they're also things that I knew were complicated enough that they had their own slides. So we'll begin right away with closures. Oh wait, no. I have an extra slide here. So what is JavaScript? It's it was not, a line. It's not what? Java. It is not Java. It should be Java. There's nothing good about JavaScript, and Java is pretty cool. At least that's what I would have told you a week ago. It's a dynamic scripting language. So what that means is it runs through the script. Types are dynamic. You don't have static type checking, and you kind of assign variables to whatever you need them to be. It was created in 1995, and it kind of adds some dynamic content to your web browser. And then in 2009, the world ended, and nobody noticed, when they invented Node.js which allowed JavaScript to pick up from its nice jail in the browser and go run on the server <laughs> like everybody else. And then the world just kind of slid into the gutter. Yep. So now you'll find that out there in the world, there's JavaScript running, supporting <laughs> web pages on backends, and you look at it and you say, why? And why did you do this? And robots, and cell phones, and every other thing on <laughs> Earth that shouldn't have JavaScript in it. Amen. I see somebody dancing in the back. Apparently you like no? Yes, because V8 is fast. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe it's fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta confess, a lot of my examples were run through Node because it's way faster than pulling up a console in the browser and scratching my head. I could just run it in Node and hey, look, it, it acted like Python. Is that because they're seeing the other? Yeah, it's because they worked really hard at optimizing the JavaScript engine for, I think it was Chrome, right? right. And then they pulled it out and said, hey, look, it can run as a standalone, like, optimized JavaScript parser, and you can run stuff on the command line, and you can use all of JavaScript's nifty features, all of which are evil, which is why the world came to an end in 2009. <laughs> so the Mayan calendar, it was a little bit late in the game. <laughs> all right, so as we said, what does Node.js want? The same thing we do every night. And if you don't get that reference, come talk to me later. <laughs> and it means I'm also very old. So closures. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've been trying to get to for like four slides now, is closures. So, imagine you're going on vacation. What do you do to go on vacation? You pack things in a bag. This is my vacation bag. As you can see, I have everything I need. I've got a keyboard, I've got a bit of wire, a little battery pack that is bright pink with my name on it, some <laughs> random lights, and an old defunct wireless router. Because when I go on vacation, that's what I need to be me, right? I need to sit down at my desk and have one of these tiny little microcontrollers that I can do scale work for, right? So when I go on vacation, I bring a bag with me so that when I get there, I don't have to look around and say, well, where's my computer? Where's my microcontroller? Where's my wireless router? I have everything I need to be me, the engineer, on vacation, because that's what I do on vacation. Closures are the same concept for functions. When you create a, a function and assign it to a variable, there are some other variables at creation time that you need. So you're creating a function, and you might have some user input that you passed into the creation. Well, when you take that function and send it through a function call and make it run far, far, far away, it still needs that user input. So what a closure is, is it takes your variables at creation time and packs them inside the function so that when it moves somewhere else, it has those variables it needs. So let's take an example. Let's say you have a function that performs mathematics, plus, minus, division, subtraction, right? And you have user input say which operation you're going to perform, right? Plus, minus, multiplication, division. And then you want to send that function to your Node.js server so that it can run the function on Node.js, right? Well, a closure would be nice because you can pack that operation variable inside the function. And we'll see a real example here shortly. And then send it across to somewhere else, and it has the data it needs packed inside so that it doesn't look around and say, oh, I don't have what I need, right? So. Here's a great example. This is our function. All it does is create a set of loggers keyed 0 through 9. And when you call this logger, it will print out a message that says this is a low severity message. And it will give you the severity in, as, as the front header. So right here you can see this console.log severity plus the message. And then I have two test lines down here. 
So here, we've got a for loop where we're looping through every conceivable number, and we're assigning it into this closure. This piece here is the closure. And that severity is populating here, so that every time somebody calls this, say loggers at zero, call it, you'll get the number appended to the front. That way they can always see what number severity it was. We're taking that severity and we're cramming it into the function so it's always available even if this logger code is shipped to another part of the program. Make sense? Most. Most. Great. There's a problem, however. If you run this specific code, you get this output. 10, 10. Is that the output we expected? No. No. We expected zero. This is a low severity message, right? Here's our zero. And 10 should not even be there ever. We expected a 9 in that place. So there's clearly a problem here. It's not and really a closure yet. It is a closure. This thing is fully a closure. The problem is with variable scoping. So the problem is variables have different scopes. They can exist in your current set of braces here and here, which is called block scoping. They sit in the block of code they're in, and most blocks are defined by curly braces, or if you're a Python fanatic, it's indentation. That creates a block, your variables live there and nowhere else. Or they can be like they are in some dynamic languages where they're scoped to the function, which means they live at the definition of the function you're in, and they never exit scope until you leave the function. And here's the problem. The var keyword here is saying, we need variable scope here in this function. It's not block scope, it's function scope. So here, you define your severity with a var keyword, and the next iteration for the loop, what does it do? Well, it changes severity, right? We've got it, where did it go? Right here, severity plus plus. So severity goes up, right? But it never left scope, so you don't get a new variable. You keep the old one and change its value. Which means when it's stuck in this closure, it can be inside that closure all you want, and because of improper scoping, it sits there and changes every time, and the last value of severity to come out of the loop is 10. That's when you break. And notice, 10 is down here. Why? Because for each iteration of the loop, the variable was not destroyed and create a new one. It's at function scope, which means it lives here, changes for each iteration, and pollutes inside your closures, even if they were sent far away. This is a problem. This is why function scoping is bad. And I believe Python also does variable at function level scoping, so you've got to be very careful in Python when you're creating closures to not inadvertently reassign values in your closure that you've packed inside. So some of you may be like, oh my goodness, I don't understand any of this, but how do we fix it? Well, the fix is easy. Recently, yeah, go ahead. Is this similar to maybe a more simple example of the same kind of scoping problem is that if you, uh, has to do with like having var and then having conditionals and those blocks like ch changing it or like creating a new variable inside of there actually creates it outside of it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So another great example of the same scoping problem is if you have var nested inside an if, if statement, that var is created at the level above. <coughs> which you would never expect. Which you'd never expect. Because it declared up there. It but isn't it's up declared there. up there. Yeah. Precisely. Because it's JavaScript. Right, this is JavaScript. However, recently they've added something to the language called let. For those of you who understood nothing else, Always use let, never use var. Yeah. There is no reason ever that you should use var. You should just correct your function scoping instead. Let says, we're going to define the variable in block scope, which is what you expect. It's the programmer's intuition. So here, I do the exact same thing. It's the exact same code, but I use let, which means at the end of this function, when we're looping again, that variable is destroyed and recreated. Why does that help? Because now, as we're looping and repacking uh, this um, closure here, it actually changes for each iteration. So rather than getting to the end and having all of your variables set to 10, the first time through the loop, it's set through the zero. The second time through the loop, it's set to one, etc. So when we call the zero and the nine versions of the logger, we actually get zero and nine here at, at the bottom. And using his example, if you have an if statement and you define a let variable inside the if statement and try to use it outside the if statement, you get an error, Yay. which is exactly what you expect, right? So what do we learn about JavaScript? 
the var keyword is awful, yeah. and you should always use let, with one exception. If you want a constant value that will never change, you can use the const keyword, because it does exactly what let does, but it doesn't allow you to overwrite variables that you said this should be a constant forever. So use that pair of functions, and don't ever use var again. I see people, my gripe with const is, I don't know if this is a group therapy at this point, but. <laughs> yeah, it can be group therapy, okay, sure, nice. My gripe is I, I, I would see people use it uh, for objects, and then they would write to those objects. And so technically you're not overwriting the object itself, but I don't know, it just seems, always, always seems counterintuitive, all the ways I saw it used. Right. So is it a single I don't believe so. I'm not 100% sure. So Scala evolved out of Java, and Java has proper block scoping on all of its variables. So I think the var in Scala is just a shorthand for, I don't want to name its type. But I don't believe that, that the var keyword creates improperly scoped variables yeah. because it runs in the Java virtual machine and that will enforce, enforce scoping for you. So my best guess, I haven't used Scala in years and years, is that the var keyword obeys block scoping, which is what everybody intuitively yeah, expects. Bottom, bottom. So I, I can't answer the nuances between those two without doing a little research. Because like I said, it's been like four or five years since I've used Scala. And that was like two days, and then I went back to programming Java. So. <laughs> However, just remember, in JavaScript, a best practice now is to use let. It sets you up for block scoping. Your variables will do what you expect. And when you do something cool with a closure or something else, you won't have random variables ruining your day. I've spent hours and hours debugging this issue, and then I discovered let, and the problem goes away. <laughs> so we're going to move away from closures to old and new inheritance. Now, if any topic tonight is going to get me boos and jeers and hatred, it will be this one. So we're going to dive right in. Who knows about inheritance? Anyone? I'm talking about genetics right now, not code. So basic genetics says, standard genetics is, you have a mother and a father and they produce offspring, right? But then, just a few years ago, a new concept walked onto the scene, and it was actually quite a long time ago, but people have been giving it more interest. It's called horizontal gene transfer. Who knows what horizontal gene transfer is? Anyone? This is like the coolest idea in all of genetics. So essentially it's just, I spit my DNA at you, and now you have my properties. So this happens a lot in bacteria, right? So you have these bacteria, and they collide, and they spit some DNA over, and now the whole bacterial colony has the same properties. So how many of you know what the biggest, most terrifying thing to come out of hospitals recently is? Say it out loud. Yeah, but what is it? Right, it's super bugs. Resistant to antibiotic bacteria, right? Terrifying, you can't kill them. My dad has been in the hospital for a month because he got one and they can't kill it. They've tried like 10 antibiotics. He's doing better, so you need not worry. But how did these bugs arise? Well, because somebody didn't take enough antibiotics, so one bug was there like, hey, you didn't kill me off, and I developed some resistance, random mutation. And then what does it do? Does it produce a genetic line of bacteria that all are resistant by dividing? Well, that would be kind of slow. No, what it does is like, hey, all you bacteria out there in the system, spray DNA, and now everybody is resistant. That's why these things seem to develop so fast, is horizontal dream gene transfer. They can just spray DNA out into other cultures of bacteria, and those other cultures of bacteria pick it up, and are like, okay, we're resistant now, we have the resistance genes, which is why these things are terrifying. And now, you guys must be wondering, why on earth is he talking about genetics in the middle of a JavaScript <laughs> talk? I'm gonna pause for suspense. <laughs> So here's our classical inheritance. This very much follows the mother-father way of creating children, right? You define some base classes, A, B, C, X, Y, and then you extend them from one another, creating an inheritance tree, right? We've all done some basic object-oriented programming, I hope. If not, the basic idea is a class defines some properties. In this case, we define property A and B. 
And then from that class, we subclass it into other classes to add attributes. This is like children that have different attributes from their parents, right? I have red hair, my parents both have black hair. It's wonderful, right? New attributes in this base class. So it now has the properties of A and B and also has at Y and Z. And then down here, our last class in the tree, we have a three-level tree, is standard. It inherits from the guy above him and adds this nice little static main function because, in case you didn't notice, we're now working in Java. And it runs the program and prints out all variables. And the output is one, two, eight, seven, which is exactly what we expect, right? It inherits properties. But let me ask you this. We've inherited a bunch of properties with our class. What else have we inherited? Anyone? Okay, we also inherit functions that's correct. I haven't defined any, but that is a good answer. What else do we inherit in the standard inheritance model? Hmm? I'm not sure what you mean by that. It's kind of a mystery because for most of us who do standard object-oriented programming, like me every day, you don't think about it. You inherit the class tree, right? So standard is an XYZs, and XYZs is an ABC. So everything that comes with this strict, highly coupled model of inheritance comes with it. So this is as slow and as sluggish as normal genetic inheritance, right? You need Two people, they create offspring, the offspring de develop traits, and if they're good traits, they survive and, you know, continue, right? Darwinian evolution. It's very slow compared to just spraying genes at everybody <laughs> and having everybody suddenly develop the attributes they need. In this case, you have a very slow, very tightly coupled class structure. So, there's no way to have a standard that has properties A, B, X, and Y that isn't also an ABC type, right? You can't just have another type spontaneously take on those attributes because it's forced to be an ABC in terms of structure. Just like I can't stand up here today and say, oh, I'm suddenly a cat because my parents were people and there's no way that the cat can just send attributes my way and I'm suddenly cat-like, right? I have standard slow inheritance. But with bacteria, they can just kind of make each other antibiotic resistant and glow all they want, and they're just sharing genes. So, you call it, we're talking about mix-ins, which is a different way of inheritance, and it really it isn't really inheritance, it's composition. So for those of you who are familiar with the Gang of Four, they're like, the people who wrote all of the important books that I studied in college, and they say, inheritance, it's far worse than composition. Instead of inheriting this strict structure to get your properties, you should just have your objects be composed of the properties of other objects. Essentially, we're talking about horizontal gene transfer. That is, look, we create a blank object. This is a nothing object. We create two other objects with the properties we want, and we just assign the properties from ABCs and XYZs to object. Did it come with type information? No. Did it come with a class structure? No. It just came with the properties we need. So now object has A, B, Y, and Z properties. We can use them, we can take advantage of them, and we can move forward with our program knowing that it has these properties but we have saved ourselves this very rigid class structure that is hard to break out of and hard to modify. If we need to modify object, we don't have to go fiddle with the base class and hope that it doesn't break anything. We just take another object and say, assign your properties over here. Okay? Does that make sense or do we have questions? Makes sense. Right. Yes, question. It's less secure because um, there's no check on whether this is Spoken like a true master of static type languages. <laughs> I like this guy. I like his opinions. So you're right. This is insecure, and we'll get it get into it in just a second. But his, his essential question is this: If you have no idea what properties are guaranteed by your type, how do you move about the world? And that brings in duct type. 
<laughs> so the idea behind duct typing has been popular in dynamic languages for quite some time. It essentially is this. If I walk like a duck and talk like a duck, I am therefore a duck. Doesn't matter what other properties I have, if I define the right walk and I define the right talk, I am a duck. Right? So we have a nice little example here. We have some real ducks. And we have Hello Kitty wearing a duck suit. But she defines the bill, which means she can talk, and she has the little feet. So therefore, she is a duck for these purposes of duck typing. So what this does is it allows us to create objects that instead of looking at their type and saying, can we use this in this situation, we just say, if you have the right properties defined, you can be a duck. And we can treat you like a duck and feed you bread, even though you may be a cat in a duck costume. So this is the idea behind duck typing. It's used a lot in Python. It's used a lot in JavaScript. It's used a lot in many dynamic languages. If I want something that defines function foo, I just add function foo to it and say good job. I don't need an inheritance or a parent class that says you define foo. I just stick foo in and move on. Which brings us to my big plea of the night. This is my heartfelt plea. Please, please, please be careful with your duct type. Start at the beginning of the program, assign in the properties you need at the beginning of the program, and write good, clean documentation that tells people what properties your objects define. And don't change it in the middle of the program. Because duct typing says, well, if it's not a duck, because it doesn't walk like one and it doesn't talk like one, we can just poke it and add the properties it needs and suddenly it's a duck, right? But that leads to some major confusion when you inherit the code. Because now you've got these objects that start out as one type and spontaneously change to another. So use horizontal gene transfer. Assign your properties in so you have a nice collapsed class structure that is dynamic and easy to change and then use proper design principles to establish it once and well document it so that readers of your code aren't being like, wait, this changed types, it now defines all these properties, oh, the properties disappeared, because otherwise you will get this duck. <laughs> A giant tree-eating duck, but as we've seen, it has two feet and it says quack quack, therefore it's a duck, <laughs> right? Duck typing can be very dangerous, but it can also be very powerful. So as you're using JavaScript, be nice, think a little bit like a C or C++ developer, establish a firm data model, construct it as efficiently as possible using duct typing, and then leave it reasonably static for the rest of your program so that people who trace through your code have any idea what's going on. You can construct these object hierarchies and object types quickly and effectively at the beginning of the program and then leave them fixed so that people reading your code and functions can reference documentation and not have the documentation need to change based on which part of the program they're in. Any questions? Sounds totally reasonable. Thank Great. you. Great. So that's my heartfelt plea. I like this ability to quickly make objects that define properties. I don't like the ability to change it in the middle of the program because then people just wander around confused and your language becomes Perl. Okay. I'm a Perl programmer. We were almost friends. Uh, is we this your work of art? Uh, we'll talk about it. Okay. So, <laughs> now we're going to talk about some callbacks. Remember the last few items that I talked about at the beginning of the talk? Callbacks, callbacks, callbacks. So JavaScript is essentially an event-driven uh, uh, language. You click on a button, that's an event. That event goes through and finds a registered callback, and that callback runs. So for those of you who have programmed callbacks, or JavaScript, you say button.onclick, and then pass it a function, and when the user clicks it, your alert pop-up pops up, because we all use alerts, right? Right? <laughs> so that's what a callback is. You register it to an event, and you call back into it later, so you can pop up your alert and annoy your user. Right? <laughs> now, there's a small problem with callbacks, which is known as, I think I've heard it called the callback pyramid. So, I want to load three resources. So I load one, here's our load program, it just prints out the URL. And then, as a callback, it registers a second load, which requires another callback, which registers a third load, and we have this nice kind of pyramid thing going on, and if I had four or five resources that all had to be loaded one after the another, our pyramid would just grow. Is this code readable? Mm -hmm. If I had 20 callbacks chaining off one another, would it be readable? No, you just get this scoping problem. 
just like C used to do before they invented the else if. You'd have if, else, if, else, if, else, and it was just nuts, right? So this is really hard to maintain because you have all these callbacks that require registering callbacks on their return function, right? But we get a nice result. If you run this code, you get first, second, third, and done. So enter in the concept that somebody talked about at the beginning, promises. This is like the, my favorite thing that JavaScript added in the recent years. A promise is just a formalized way of doing a callback that allows you to use some nifty syntax. So essentially you say, I want to load my URL, and I'm going to return immediately a promise to do future work, okay? And that promise says, the user will pass me a resolve function, and I'll call it when I'm done. So it looks like a callback, right? Some future work will happen, and then the function you passed it will be executed. Isn't that great? But look, here you can see that promises use the then call to allow chaining. So instead of having that big, deep pyramid, I can do load the first, then load the second, then load the, load the third, then print done, right? Very easy, very straightforward, no pyramid, and it all looks consistent. So there isn't all this weird syntax where we're jamming functions in the middle of like three deep functions. Hard to edit. This is easy to edit. Now, this is a promise. Promises also give you some other amazing characteristics, which is that if the callback finishes before the register call finishes, you get the promise to be called at least once. So in the old style callbacks, this screen, if load finishes before, sorry, if load here finishes before this function is fully registered, which shouldn't happen in this code, but might happen in some other types of code, it'll miss the call. And you'll be like, where's my event? Well, it's because you tried to register a callback and you were too slow and the event happened first. In the promise style, if you do that, you're guaranteed that the promise will execute at least once. So all that boilerplate code you have to add to trap the condition where you check to see if it's done before you register the callback collapses into just one call. Then, pretty simple, right? The other thing it allows you to do is catch exceptions in this tree. So you can catch an exception using a catch clause and then do another callback and another chain with then to fix it. So you can have, I think it's called a catch function, and then you do catch.then to do something else. So it allows you to formalize the way you ha handle exceptions, which would be a nightmare in this tree because the exceptions could happen anyway. So as you're writing your new JavaScript code, use promises instead of callbacks. They take just a little bit of time to learn, and then they pay for themselves in spades with cleaner, more uh, focused code. So I think that's pretty much the end of my talk. But I'm here. I like questions. So if you have questions about JavaScript, please ask. Because I wanted to give you a crash course in three of the things that I find in JavaScript that often give me the most frustration. And now's your chance to ask. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Do you find yourself using await all of the time? Uh, await. Explain it a little bit. So with a promise, because it's JavaScript, a lot of times it won't just do what you said right away. It's mm -hmm. going to be doing it in the background somewhere. Right. And so if you need it to block, as you would expect in any other programming language, mm -hmm. use the await keyword and actually stops the program and okay. awaits the... But do you find yourself using that a lot because code is, is confusing if you don't? I never use await. And the reason is I'm quite often writing JavaScript for UI applications. Yeah. And I learned very long ago in UI, you never want to block on the user thread. So if the user presses a button which triggers an event, you never want a long running task there because then the UI hangs. Right. And the user gets mad and starts clicking, right? How many of you use programs where the UI hangs? Yeah. yeah. And what do you do? You start furiously clicking, saying, obey me. And what is the program doing on the back end? It's saying, I'm going to do this long task. Oh, I'm going to start over and do a long task. Oh, I'm going to start over and do a long task. And it never finishes. So when you're writing event code based on user input in JavaScript, make it as clean and efficient as possible. 
exit as fast as possible or return as fast as possible and leave the processing to a background thread or some other type of uh, thing. So in JavaScript, you might register like a timer that calls you every once in a while, and you might handle long running tasks in that timer so that when the user clicks, they don't have to wait for their long task. Because nothing makes a user more angry than a long running task on a UI facing thread. For those of you who do Android or iPhone development, I know Android, I don't know iPhone so well, but they give you background tasks. Android is very good at having you register a service in the background that'll sit and do work for you so that you can return to the UI quickly. And they say use it. And no new programmer ever does because they're like, why would I send my work over there when I can do it here? <laughs> but your UI will lag and your, your users will be furious. But if you just kind of take that event and queue it somewhere, and then pop that event off the queue and process it off the UI thread in the background, your user will be happy because their click will return and they can go back to like browsing cat images on the internet while your code kind of chugs through and does the work. So that's a great tidbit about JavaScript. And that's why I wanted to open it up to questions on the end, is we can learn a lot just by asking about certain things, like the await function. Go ahead. <coughs> yeah. That's a good question. Does duck typing get combined with classical inheritance? So, to answer that question, where's my inheritance? Here we go. So, this type of inheritance, when you're taking properties and just assigning them to an object, do not use the instance of or what type is it functions. Why? Because there is no type information here. We just took properties and injected them in, and there is no defined type, right? So when your bacteria is sharing genes, what can you say about it? You can say it's a bacteria, right? You can't really even say that it's, uh, say, E. coli anymore, because it might have changed its type of bacteria based on the genes that come through it, and it might be something entirely new. So when you inject properties like this, you need to document how it behaves, document what properties it has and what properties it does not have, but you should not expect it to obey what type is it, because you'll just get, it's an object, and that's all you'll get. Now, so that kind of, uh, what you're describing is this. You have a class that is part of a standard inheritance model, and then you add some properties to it to make it do something. I've found in my programming, maybe not your programming, but in my programming, that's the quickest way for me to create our little Frankenstein monster here. Because I've taken what is a very well-defined type that forces you to have a duck because of its inheritance tree, and I started adding properties to it. So that's where I find myself in danger. So if it's me, I stick to one of these two inheritance models. I either build a full class hierarchy, which don't get me wrong, there's sometimes I feel you need to do this. Other JavaScript developers say you never need to do this, but that's them. And sometimes I do this. What I find when I do things where I take duct typing and inject them into something else, my developer instinct says I'm doing something evil, like I did at work today. So I have this nice inheritance tree built off of Python unit tests so that I can extend the unit test functionality and still have it run as a test. Then I need it, Then I had two tests, each of which inherit from up the tree, and I said, I need these tests from this function over here, and I don't want to rewrite them. So the proper way to do that in an object-oriented model would be to pull them into the appropriate parent face class and then inherit them both down. But that was going to be slow and require a lot of refactoring. So I just did this horizontal gene transfer, and I just copied them in. Now, that's not very nice to my users, because I've given them no indication that that's where the functions came from, except two lines of code that are very obscure Python syntax. And anybody who tries to maintain this will be like, where are these functions defined? Another important problem with this scenario is, I took properties from one object and moved them over to the other, but those properties assume something about the object tree, right? They assume the parent class's properties do. I didn't grab those. So if I wasn't careful, I'd run this code, and it would go and run this function, and that function would say, 
huh, this function you're calling inside me doesn't exist because you're not part of the inheritance tree where I was created. So, unless you really have a strong opinion on this or know far better than I do, do not mix these two types. If you want to use composition, which is what this is, with your standard inheritance tree, use standard uh, composition, where you create a member variable and then sign it to a class, which brings in the ideas that you need. And leave it statically typed. But don't try to duct type an existing class tree like I've done, because that'll just confuse your users. And now that I think about it, I should probably go rewrite this code that I published at work today. Yeah. Great. Does that answer your question? Yeah, go ahead. Is the way you're describing composition similar to how with Go does with struct? I'm not familiar with Go structs. I'm very So, standard composition in object oriented languages like Java, C, Python for the most part, uh, and what others, Ruby and some. Perl. Is, no, Perl is evil and we will not talk about it here. <laughs> Perl and PHP live at the lowest layer below JavaScript. So far below JavaScript that people who write in those languages, you have to wonder if they're sane. But you might wonder if I'm sane too, so that's another story. <laughs> Classical inheritance allows you to do composition by defending a member property. So, if I have a car and I want it to be composed of four tires and a driver's seat, I would have member property driver's seat equals new driver's seat, member property uh, tires equals an array of four tires, right? So I've composed it by having members point to the classes that have the property of those things. It's a little bit pedantic because then you have to say car dot tires at zero dot inflate, right? You have to move through each of those steps. But that's how you do it in an object-oriented model, a classical object-oriented model. In this realm, we're just taking the tires and jamming them into our object and saying you have them. And you just say, you know, if this were a car, you'd say car dot tire one, done. But that's not necessarily clean to do if you have an existing object tree. Because when the user sees something like class, or they see an existing object hierarchy, they think, I can use type of. But if you start adding properties in the side, they can't use type of, and all this type information gets kind of weird. So use one so that you can use type of and have a standard object tree, that's fine. Or use this other method where you're composing it of properties and use duct type and document it and only do it at the beginning so that everybody can follow what you're doing. Make sense? Great, any other questions? I love them, keep them going. Yes? You said something that I was unfamiliar with. Like, were you implying uh, that uh, making uh, inheritance is an expensive process, and it's so uh, why is that? It's a hard to uh, maintain process. So this is what's known as the brittle base class problem, and a lot of this I'm quoting off of some JavaScript blog that I read last night at midnight, and that was the moment when I, I, like, I started reading this blog and this guy is explaining this cool way of composing objects, and I'm like, this guy is an idiot and I hate everything he stands for, and I hate <laughs> JavaScript, and then I thought about it for a second and I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, this is not a bad idea, as long as you do it right. So I've explained both methodologies, classes, and kind of uh, composing objects of properties so that you guys have both tools in your toolbox. Now, your question was... If the inheritance is expensive, you said it's, it's, long, it's a long process? I think that so expensive. it's a long process to write. It's expensive for the programmer. How many of you have ever programmed in Java and like really done Java the super Java way where you have a class that inherits a class that inherits a class that inherits a class that implements four or five different interfaces which then inherit classes which have other interfaces and now you have interfaces in classes like this in your <laughs> Oh, I don't even want to think about that. I just love having classes called Impl. Right. <laughs> So things in the enterprise Java world did start to change with Spring. They tried to reduce some of these objects and interfaces. But if you work with data people and people who really love object-oriented programming, they create these wicked complex um, object-oriented paths. 
I once had work at my job. This was when I started. I was a brand new programmer, and I had to debug a, a, a problem in what should be a very simple thing. It goes out and it downloads a file, right? It's wget, right? That's all it does. It should, it should call wget internally. There were 20 layers of interfaces in 20 different files that I had to go through by hand to find the one line of code in 100 that actually did something and change a slight property. This was Java? This is Java. How many XML files were there of configuration? Uh, probably 100 XML. <laughs> yeah. That's another Java thing is they like XML. They love XML. So that shows you what the brittle base class, class excuse me, that's the brittle base class problem. There are so many levels of inheritance that your inheritance tree suddenly becomes very, very powerful, and you can change it at any level with subclassing, but it's very hard for a developer to maintain because they've got to dig through 20-some files. And then they find the code they need at the very top, and they change the line, and it fixes their problem, and what does it do? Breaks everything else. It breaks everyone else's code because everybody was using this and expecting it to work one way. You fixed it for this guy down here, and all the other 99 inheritors are now like, we're broken. <laughs> right? So that's what I meant by it's an expensive process. Oh, I, I thought you meant for the, for the machine. I was like, I oh, no, no. On, on the machine, these are all virtual pointer tables and witchcraft, and it goes really, <laughs> really fast. <laughs> but. In, in the Java inheritance model, it takes a programmer a good solid afternoon to make a simple fix. And in this model, you just go find the property you want and you overwrite it with a fix. And you don't affect anybody else because they're inheriting their genes from the old version. Right? Done. Easy. Quick to maintain. Document it or it will become a nail in your coffin because you've made a change that isn't reflected anywhere in any like statically generated information. So you just kind of make a fix, it fixes the problem, and nobody can reproduce it. So that's why I keep stressing documentation on this model, is because the one thing a standard class tree gives you is very clear self-documentation of what the object pattern is. So if you're going to throw it out and go with a flat model of inheritance or composition, document it. Some of what you're explaining right now with uh, kind of Futzing with the properties, and you're saying document. It sounds like monkey patching. It is monkey patching. Which I heard you say that word earlier. So what's monkey patching? So monkey patching is where you take an object and you just kind of poke properties into it until it does what you want, right? So lots of people used to do this with strings in JavaScript because strings didn't have basic functions that you expected. There were certain things like, oh, I need a substring that didn't exist in JavaScript at the beginning. And all these C programmers come over, and they have the C standard library for strings, and they should say, we should have a tokenizer. We should have a string length function. Yeah, that, they're nice, but they didn't exist in JavaScript. So what did people do? They took their string, they found the ancestor of the string on the path, and they said, your dot uh, tokenizer function is now this. Great, now they can use a tokenizer. And then the next person to inherit this code looks at it and says, this is JavaScript and the string has a tokenizer? It must not be a standard string, it must be somewhere else. Then they go digging through the code for days and days and days, and then they find one little line at the bottom of a file that says string dot tokenize, actually it's string dot prototype dot tokenize equals a function. And they pull out their hair because it wasn't documented. So if you're going to add properties to existing objects, document it and do it in one clean setup place and leave it there. A lot of this was done in some of the JavaScript frameworks, which I'm specifically not talking about today because they're an even bigger beast that we won't have time to get into. But they wrap up a lot of these functions and keep them inside. A nice, clearly documented interface of what they've changed. Go onto the jQuery website, look at their documentation. They tell you about every single function they added to the dollar sign variable so that you know what it does. You should mimic their documentation if you're going to mimic their pattern of monkey patching everything. Should you mimic their indentation best practices? Um, Eight spaces? I like four, <laughs> yeah. but that's up to the user. We're not going to talk about spaces and syntax. You all can do that for yourself, and if you still use apps, we're not friends. <laughs> Any other questions about JavaScript code? Why do you not hate it? Oh, why do I not hate yeah. it anymore? 
So when I was doing this talk, I really wanted to come up here and just go through it and say, look, JavaScript is terrible. They have function scope variables. They have this weird callback model. They have this silly thing with crappy inheritance. And then I started reading into it, and I said, wait a minute. The JavaScript community has actually made intelligent fixes to a lot of the problems that existed in JavaScript from 10 years ago when I was first learning. And they fixed their problems. They introduced the let keyword. They introduced promises. They have this new model of object that assign, which is one of the newest features they've added. So that you can program in a JavaScript-centric way and do your code in a nice, neat, efficient, compact model. So it's no longer the weird strings of jQuery bashing and you know weird callbacks that JavaScript used to be. It's now a relatively formalized language. The one thing that they haven't gotten their act together on, in my opinion, is the ability to import scripts into one another so that you can use library code. But they've been working on that, and the community has created libraries that will help you do that, even if it's not part of the standard JavaScript. So I can't really say I hate it anymore because they made intelligent fixes to their problems, unlike Perl. Any other questions? How many Perl programmers out there? Don't make me raise my hand. And you don't have to raise your hand. I just wanted to know how many stones are going to be thrown at you in the parking lot later. Zero. Uh, does JavaScript support multiple inheritance? So Java does not. Our code example here was Java because I went with Java because Java is like the golden example of thou shalt use object-oriented programming and nothing else. They cram objects and classes down your face so that you can't not do it. Unless it's a what? <laughs> yes. If it's a, but to get that That's int, cruel. it must exist inside a class. You cannot have a function outside a class, so you cannot declare an int outside a class. So you're right, an int isn't an object. But then they went and wrapped. I always like, use integer myself. Yeah, integer is a wrapped version of int so that you can have int. That's where classes. it is like Java. What? That's where it is like Java. Yeah. Primitives versus. So I went with Java here. So JavaScript doesn't actually use straight classical inheritance. They use something called prototype inheritance, which is basically objects inherit from one another. So you take your standard object tree and you strip out the class definitions and you just say, this object is a child of that other object. So instances inherit from each other rather than a blueprint, right? It's kind of hard to understand. But it's very easy to implement standard inheritance on top of prototype inheritance by just using it as you would expect it to. So I didn't really want to dig into it in this talk. If you'd like to talk about what prototype inheritance is more, we can uh, chat more afterwards. Or go but, to the, uh, that new meetup. Yeah, or go to that new meetup and come and sit and have a happy hour with us, and we'll talk about prototype inheritance until my voice gives out. Question over here. Why do you need JavaScript compilers, as in why are people writing stuff in another language and compiling it to JavaScript? So we really need JavaScript compilers because the most important creation of mankind was to play the original Doom game in your browser. That's why JavaScript compilers exist. I'm being somewhat facetious. But we wanted the ability to compile old C code and have it run in the browser. Why? I didn't even bother to ask because Doom in your browser is cool and Linux running in your browser is also very cool, even though it's slow. Linux in a virtual machine in your browser. Right. Right. It's so you can do insane things for insane reasons. That's what pro code is good for. But I will talk a little about, about what I thought you were going to ask about, which is precompilers. So. Oh, no. Don't say transpile. Transpile, yes. Exactly. Thank you. So I'm actually a pretty big fan of Transpile because it allows me to do a JavaScript program on my computer and run some static analysis checks like type checking, did I spell things right, and get standard compiler errors before I launch this to the public and have them be like, your JavaScript produced this weird error in my console and I don't understand and you have to fix it. Well. C and C++ and Java and all those nice, wonderful compiled languages had a good idea about actually checking for programming errors before you ship the code. And so what transpilers do is allow you to write JavaScript or one of its 50,000 dialects and scan it for standard errors, scan it for logic errors, run unit tests, and then compile it all into one script so that you can use these import flags and have one script that you pop in your browser at the end. 
So, I love transpilers because they give you a little bit of the essence of C and p compiler checking in your JavaScript development, but the downside is you need a build step where you build the JavaScript code before you deploy it to the server. But it gives you this nice little minified script that you can say, look, I'm one of the big boys because my script is minified. I mean, that's what all the cool cats do, right? Yes? You said you in the testing. I was going to ask you. <clears throat> Given your background, well, besides C++, uh, you said Java and Python, so I'm sure you have you done unit testing in those languages. Mm -hmm. What's your experience doing with JavaScript with unit testing? So, how feasible is it? Is it is it pleasant? Is it a nightmare? It depends on how you build your JavaScript. Yeah. So first of all, I'll say thou shalt JavaScript. I mean, unit test. If you do not unit test your code. Learn to unit test. I mean, seriously, I have saved my bacon in meetings at work so many times, but just having unit tests catch my problems before my boss looks at it and said, you're fired. <laughs> unit tests go through and they test bits of your code to make sure they're working properly to scare out bugs before they get to production. Now, in JavaScript, the only time I've ever done unit testing is under one of these big UI frameworks. I was using Aurelia for a while. It's a competitor to, what's the one, uh, Angular 2. And inside, they reference the Jasmine Uniscript library, which I kind of ignored in my first write, because I'm like, nobody unit tests in JavaScript. And then I went back and I said, they made me write unit tests at work for my C++ code, and it saved me so much time and energy. I'll write some unit tests in Jasmine. And in 15 minutes, I had a basic suite of unit tests up and running. So I found it very easy to do. But my framework dr uh, dropped in the basic template files for me, so I didn't have to think about setting up the Jasmine library. I think it's called Jasmine. But, what? what? Yeah, I'm sure there are several. That's one of my biggest irritations with JavaScript, is there are 10 frameworks to do every problem, and nobody bothers to like consolidate and unify. They're just like, we'll create more. So now we have Angular, Angular 2, Aurelia, Backbone. What language is that not true? Uh, Java, because they stuck Aurelia. everything yeah. in a standard library. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, a lot of languages like this problem where they split off and create a ton of frameworks, but no language have I found it as irritatingly done as in JavaScript because all of those frameworks require different ways of finagling your imports. In Python, they have a billion Python packages to do everything under the sun six different ways, but you just say import package and you're using it, and so you don't even notice. And in JavaScript, you have to download files and install them on your server and link them together, and it's a pain in the neck. Anyway, more questions? Oh, a related gripe. Sure. From my experience, like working on JavaScript projects, people would just, like their package.json and node, it had like 40 dependencies, and I'm like, why do you need this? I don't know. It's just, <laughs> yeah. We just use it, it's cool. Yeah. And then that was not a problem in Perl, not a problem in Java. Like it seems like in, in those communities, the culture is like, oh, I use this because of X, Y, and Z. Whereas in Java, it's like, oh, just throw it together. And then there's like no awareness of what your software is actually doing. You're saying CPAN doesn't exist? What? <laughs> CPAN's great. Yeah, but that's the There's a lot of bad that's stuff on right? there, but like. Huh? It's just that's another way of importing it. Like, just, you can, like import. For those of you who don't know Perl, don't listen. It'll just corrupt your soul. No. Perl is terrible. He said C10. He's talking about tech. No, no, no. He said C man, and I understand the vocabulary enough to know I should be running right now. So, yes, in some languages you do have problems where people use every package under the sun. Python is a great example because every package requires seven different versions of packages, and so you install one thing and then you download the internet, and then you have the whole internet on your computer to run one little Python program. Yeah. JavaScript likes to do the same thing where if you start using required JS or package.json for Node, you start getting dependency trees that are super deep. This Aurelia framework, I really like it, but I said install, and it took 15 minutes to download all of the dependencies. And they're JavaScript files, so they're like one kilobyte each. So it's downloading tens of thousands, if not millions, of yeah. JavaScript files to run this thing. Now, they managed to make it all compile and run very fast, so I found that it was actually quite responsive and I liked it, but it's a pain in the neck. So yes, if you're going to use dependencies, understand why and prune your dependency tree because otherwise you start getting version collisions and all sorts of other nasty stuff. Thanks. Uh, my voice is about out, so unless there are any other super pressing questions, I think I'm going to end tonight on a high note.
thank you for your time. I hope you have learned to both love and hate JavaScript like I have. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, we'll be meeting here again next month. Is it here? Um, no, I'm hoping to find another venue because actually I believe the speaker for December is the CEO and founder of Michael. I cannot pronounce the name of this company, Micro Duino, uh, which was uh, based on a Kickstarter back in 2013, and the idea was to use the Arduino platform and build something that you can use to teach kids how to do stuff with electronics. And so they are now selling their products on Amazon and off of their website. Um, they're really uh, big into the STEM market, so I asked him to give a talk about like his experience with the Kickstarter and with Arduino, and then like what cool stuff have people done with these products. So yeah, uh, make sure to check out our meetup page, meetup.com slash sgvtech. You can also go to our website, sgvlove.org, and there's a bunch of uh, links there to our mailing list, Slack channel, um, other stuff. We'll post fun links there. And also, welcome to all the new people here. We're glad you can make it, and hope you, have, you learned something and got something out of it, and join us next month. T-shirts. And grab some T-shirts. If you're interested in scale, come talk to Michael Brunner-Smith or Steve or any of us. Uh, yeah, thanks.